All right, good day. For this video, we will be talking about cytogenetic techniques, which will be included in the semifinals. Let's start. So before we continue, let's first define what cytogenetics is. Just to remind everyone what the subject is all about and why do we have to study cytogenetic techniques. So again, cytogenetics is the study of the physical size and structure of chromosomes. So we've been doing a lot of exercises already where um, we look at different cardiograms, you know, and we even did an assignment of that. Um, allowing us to compare chromosomes as to their size and number and structures. No? So cytogenetics nowadays is a specialized laboratory discipline, which not only looks at the size and structure of chromosomes, but also at the behavior of these chromosomes at the cellular level. Now, in order for us to actually harvest these chromosomes, cells must first be arrested at the end of prophase or in early metaphase. Why should they be arrested at this stage of mitosis? Because this is the stage where the chromosomes are compact and they are already densely staining. So remember, before mitosis, um, our chromosomes are not yet, they do not yet take that classic form of chromosome. They're still um, scattered all around the nucleus, but then in preparation for cell division, they condense themselves, right? In order to be the, the classic form of chromosomes that we know them. So we need to arrest them at prophase or metaphase so that they will already be at that classic form or classic appearance. Also, at this point in mitosis, they already have their characteristic size and shape of chromosomes, which will allow us to eventually have a result, which is your karyotype. So the karyotype checks the number of chromosomes. So the number is the number is the first priority when we look at a karyotype, so we should always count it. So again, for each chromosome number, there should be two. No, so two um, chromosomes for each number or a total of 23 pairs. Now, aside from the number, we also look at the size distribution of the chromosomes. In total, we have a, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes with 22 being somatic or body chromosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, XX for females and XY for males. Now, aside from the number and size distribution, we also looked at the length of the chromosomes. So since you did that assignment, you should already know by now that the longest chromosome is always chromosome 1. And then 1 towards 22, the length should decrease little by little. So the shortest chromosome is usually chromosome number 22. Also, we take a look at the location of the centromeres. The centromere is uh, the one that separates the Q arm and the P arm, right? And also, if you remember when we talked about chromosomal anatomy, we mentioned terms such as telomeres, um, uh, sorry, not telomeres, but acrocentric, telocentric, chromosomes not because these are examples of chromosomes with different locations of centromeres and lastly a karyotype can also tell us the location and the sizes of the g bands if you have already forgotten banding are the numbering of the genes on the chromosome all right so in total we take note of the total number of chromosomes we take note of the sex of the chromosome and if there are any extra or missing autosomal chromosome. Autosomal meaning body chromosomes. That Those are chromosomes 1 to 22. Now, if we get, let's say, a karyotype that is like this, how do we then interpret it? So again, we look at the numbers. There should be two for each number. And if you notice, there is a third copy of your chromosome 18. So by 
counting them, we would know that this is not this is not equivalent to 46 anymore. 46 because 23 pairs, right? Because there's an extra one, this is already 47. Next, we again indicate the sex of the chromosome. So XY, meaning this is a male. And we also indicate where the extra or missing chromosome is. So there is an extra chromosome number 18. So if I can just, if I can just go back one slide, and this is exactly what is being interpreted, or this is how we interpret a cardiotype. The total number of chromosomes, the sex of the chromosome, or the extra or missing chromosome. So this is how we put it into um, a statement. And this is interpreted as 47 chromosomes male with an extra autosomal chromosome at chromosome number 18. Now, of course, before we get a karyotype, we should first harvest our cells. And this is where cytogenetic techniques enter. Now, you might think that the only specimen for cytogenetics is the blood, but there are actually many different specimens available. And that is the goal of this lecture. So there are first two techniques in doing cytogenetics. The first is the classical or standard, and the second one is the more advanced or the more modern one called FISH, which is an acronym that stands for Fluorescence in Situ Hybridization. So classical or standard cytogenetic allows the visualization of the loss or gain of material. This is um, an example of this is a karyotype wherein we are able to see by looking at the chromosomes if there is an extra or a missing chromosome. While in fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH, aside from knowing if there's an extra or a missing chromosome, we are also able to see the smaller changes that happen to individual chromosomes. So it shows us changes in terms of band numbering. It shows us missing genes, not only chromosomes, but missing genes or extra genes. So it now shows us a more detailed um, picture of our chromosomes. Now let's go to the different specimens that are used in cytogenetic, whether it be classical or through fish. Of course, the most common specimen used in cytogenetics is blood. Now when we collect blood, we store them in blood tubes, such as what you see on your images. So the first is the most common blood tube. It's called a purple top because the top part or the cap of the tube is colored purple. So we call it the purple tap. Now, the specimen inside the purple tap is called EDTA. EDTA is an acronym which stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Now, EDTA or EDTA is very important. And this is also what we use when we do CBC and many other blood chemistry tests. Why? Because EDTA or EDTA prevents the coagulation of blood. Okay? So it allows us to store blood in its liquid form. Now, when you put blood in a tube that contains EDTA, it allows us to do qualitative and quantitative determination of the blood, meaning we are able to count the number of cells, the number of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in the blood. Aside from that, blood stored in EDTA or EDTA allows us to also qualify and quantify if the blood has HIV, hepatitis C, or cytomegalovirus. And the determination of these viruses is done through cytogenetics. The second tube that we have here is the yellow tap. And the chemical found inside is called acid citrate dextrose. Acid citrate dextrose can also prevent the coagulation of blood. But 
the most important function of your acid citrate is that it preserves the form and function of the cellular components. So if we want to be able to check if the organelles inside the cell are all working and are all structurally normal, then we should use acid citrate dextrose. Aside from blood, we also use urine. Urine is used in cytogenetics because it's very easy to collect. However, it's also very uncommon for scientists, doctors, or even cytogenetics, geneticists rather, to use urine. But whenever it is used, we use it to screen for bladder cancer and to monitor therapy of your bladder cancer. Now, not all types of urine are accepted. We only accept the midstream, meaning the middle portion of your urine. So when you urinate, we don't collect immediately. We wait until we get to the middle portion of your urine. That's what we collect, and we collect the first 10 ml of the midstream catch. Now, here are some evidences that urine can actually be used to screen if a person has, has bladder cancer. This is a study done in 2001 wherein they analyzed um, pheromone-induced cytogenetic disturbances on urinary proteins of laboratory mouse males. At the bottom, they also use urine to check for cancer, that's carcinosarcoma of the urinary bladder. So imagine we collect urine, we subject it to cytogenetic testing, and it tells us if there are cancer cells or if there are um, chromosomal abnormalities that can lead to bladder cancer. So if you can use blood, you can use urine, then definitely you can also use stool or feces. Now, Feces is used for the detection of colorectal cancer. I know it sounds weird that we use poop to check for the possibility of cancer, but there is a reason for it. Guys, this is an example of colon cancer. This is your large intestine, and this right in the middle is the cancer. So imagine in this diagram, this is the large intestine, and this two more that is here growing is your um, colon cancer. So definitely, um, since these are a group of cells, they will have to exfoliate or they will have to shed off, right? So those shedded off cells will definitely come in contact with your feces. And once we check feces for the presence of um, exfoliated cancer cells, then we can diagnose um, colon cancer or colorectal cancer. Now on to the more difficult, difficult um, specimens to collect, such as the cerebrospinal fluid. So from the name itself, cerebrospinal, this comes from our brain and spinal cord. Now, how do we collect this? We collect this by inserting a needle through our vertebrae reaching um, the area where CSF or cerebrospinal fluid circulates, all right? Now, once we properly have inserted the needle to that area, a whitish fluid will start to come out. And usually, four tubes are collected. So here we can see those four tubes, one, two, three, four. And what we use here for cytogenetics is tube number two. Why? Because it is believed and has been proven that tube number two is the purest out of the four. So it will definitely give us a good um, screening for any cancers or for any abnormalities that may be found in the brain or in the spinal cord. Now, when we collect cerebrospinal fluid, we check 
also chemically if it contains the proper amount of chemicals such as your protein and glucose. Normally, protein should be at the level of 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. Please do memorize this. Glucose in the CSF should only be 15 to 45 milligrams per deciliter. Red blood cells should not be found in your CSF. And white blood cells should be limited to only three cells per cubic millimeter. Also, since um, white blood cells should be limited, we should not be able to find neutrophils and lymphocytes. And xanthochromia or the yellowish color of CSF should not be observed because, again, as mentioned, CSF looks like water. It should be clear. So here we have a result of a CSF analysis, and we can see that there is increased protein, low glucose, increased white blood cell with a predominance of neutrophil. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there might be an infection inside the brain or spinal cord. Now, if there is an infection, we should also be able to determine if the infection is caused by a bacteria, a virus, a fungi, or tuberculosis. So here are some differentiating factors between the different types of infection and the normal finding of a CSF. So again, by appearance, it should look like water. If it is turbid or malabo, it might be a bacterial infection. A clear CSF may be normal or can also be caused by a viral infection. And if there is clotting involved, then it might be a fungal or a TB infection. Proteins, as mentioned in the previous slide, 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. But here, um, what they used was gram per liter. So you might be confused. They used a different um, parameter. Okay? So more than one or high if it is bacterial, less than one or low if it is viral, and 0 0.1 to 0 0.5, it is fungal or TB. Glucose in the previous slide was expressed in milligrams per deciliter again, but here it's millimoles per liter. So if it is low, then it might be a bacterial infection. If it is normal, it can be a viral infection. If it is low to normal, it can be a fungal or a TB infection. Also, WBC or white cell count, if it is increased, might be bacterial. If it is less than 1,000, it might be viral. If it is 100 to 500, it can be fungal or tuberculosis. And if there is increased neutrophils, it can be bacterial. If it is increased monocytes, it can be viral. Monocytes can also be fungal or TB. So if we go back to this um, example earlier, increased protein, low glucose, high WBC with increased neutrophils, then we can say that this might be a possible bacterial infection. So more of this when you get the third year. So just some third year motivation for you. Next, we can also use synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is the fluid found in between our joints, such as in this image. This is an image of the femur and the image of your tibia. So the connection between the femur and the tibia will form a joint, okay? And the fluid found inside is what we call synovial fluid. Now, in different diseases, um, such as an infection, microorganisms can live in the synovial fluid. Now, if we collect fluid from our joints, that's what we call arthrosynthesis. So arthro meaning joint, synthesis meaning collection. So we collected fluid from the joint. And what do we use? Usually we use a plain tube. 
Now, how does it look like when we collect fluid from the knees? This is how it would look like. We insert a needle in between the two bones and start aspirating. This is how it should normally look like. Um, or this is what we look for um, when we study synovial fluid. We look at its appearance. We look at the cell counts. We do a culture, meaning we try to multiply or grow whatever microorganisms are there. We test chemically if there is protein, glucose, and mucin clots. So as similar to your cerebrospinal fluid, there are also different um, diseases that can be found in our um, joints or in our synovial fluid. So these are the different findings. We don't have to go through this anymore. I don't need you to memorize this. But for the CSF, I do need you to memorize that. All right? So this is the one that I want you to memorize, though, no? Um, this is a more simpler comparison as compared to the previous slide. So here we have the normal appearance of synovial fluid. It should be a transparent fluid similar to water. Color is clear but should be very viscous. In Tagalog, malapot yung synovial fluid. WBC should be less than 200 and polymorphonuclear or neutrophils should be less than 25%. If it is a non-inflammatory disease, it can be similar to a normal synovial fluid except it appears yellow. It can have a little increase in your WBC. But if it is inflammatory, okay, if it is caused by an inflammation, the color changes from transparent to translucent, it still is yellow. If it is inflammatory, the viscous fluid becomes very thin or in Tagalog, malabnao. Okay? Malabnao. Um, WBC is increased since this is uh, an immune response. So our WBCs will increase to up to 10,000. And neutrophils will be above or more than 50%. If it is septic or an infection, it will appear dirty yellow. Also, WBCs will be more than 80,000 and neutrophils will be more than 75%. Lastly, if we hit a blood vessel, that's what we call hemorrhagic. It appears bloody and neutrophils will be around 50 to 75%. On to the more complicated types of specimens. Here we have amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is also what we call panubigan. Okay, so when a mother has to give birth, they always say pumotok na yung panubigan or the water broke and that water is called amniotic fluid. This is the fluid where the baby floats while he or she is inside the mother's womb. Now, amniotic fluid will tell us, okay, if there is a congenital disorder, meaning even if the baby is not yet born, then we can already know if there is a congenital anomaly by collecting the amniotic fluid. Also, amniotic fluid helps us determine fetal maturity or if the baby is already ready for delivery, Okay, especially for cases where the baby needs to be delivered much, much earlier. Okay, so this tells us if the baby's lungs have matured already and can survive in the outside world. Also, the amniotic fluid can be used to look for RH isoimmunization, meaning if there is a difference in blood type, specifically the RH blood type, then we can know by testing the amniotic fluid. Now, when do we collect the amniotic fluid? Usually, it is collected on the 15th to 20th week of pregnancy. So, usually on um, the 4th to 5th month of pregnancy. And if we want to do a culture or if we want to grow um, bacteria, fungi, or um, any microorganism present in the amniotic fluid, it will take 9 to 12 days. Now, another specimen that we get from pregnant women is what we call chorionic villus. So what is chorionic villus? 
Chorionic villus is actually a part of the placenta. And the chorionic villus is important because this can tell us any congenital anomalies much earlier compared to amniotic fluid. When can we get amniotic fluid again? Between the fourth to fifth month of pregnancy. But in chorionic villus, we can get it on the third month, second to third month of pregnancy. Okay? 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy. But it also takes a lot of time to culture, takes three weeks. So when we want to collect that, we usually do an ultrasound to guide our specimen collector and reach the chorionic villus properly and not to harm the baby. Next, we can also use pleural, pericardial, and acidic fluid. Um, usually, we do this to identify if there is any infectious agent or to check if there is any cancer. Now, when we want to collect fluid from the lungs, the heart, and the stomach or abdomen, then that's what we call parasynthesis. Now, in order for you to better visualize, here are some pictures. Pleural fluid is the fluid inside the lungs. So, insert a tube towards the lungs and drain that fluid. So this is how we do it. We insert a needle through the different layers of the skin, muscle, and then through the ribs until we reach that lung cavity. Then we uh, pull or aspirate the fluids inside. This is what we call plural fluid collection. For the pericardial fluid, there is also a fluid layer outside of the heart which protects it. Usually, we insert the needle under the siphoid. That's what we call sub-siphoid approach. Um, and we direct the needle towards the anterior wall of the right ventricle. Now, if you want to get fluid from the abdomen, that's what we call parasynthesis or abdominal parasynthesis and we basically collect the fluid from the stomach. This is how it would look like on a real person. You insert a needle and basically drain all of that fluid inside. She looks like she's pregnant, but she's not. Next specimen are buccal cells. These are the cells found in our mouth. That's why the mouth is called the buccal cavity or buccal cavity. Buccal cavity or buccal cells are an excellent source of genomic DNA because it's very less invasive. You simply have to open your mouth, get a sterile swab, and swab your way to get your specimen. For those patients who cannot do blood transfusion or cannot do bone marrow collection, usually we do buccal cell collection. However, before you collect that specimen, it should be first rinsed with mouthwash and a sterile swab must be used. Now, for more complicated cases, we can also use a solid tissue, meaning like a biopsy, let's say. No, we can use those tissue from a person um, and put it in a paraffin-embedded tissue and subject it to frozen section. So we'll slice the specimen very, very thinly Put it under the microscope and look for any abnormalities. But while we don't have to dwell about this, you'll go into this in your third year in histopath. I think this is the last one, hair and nails. Hair and nails are also used especially during forensics because it gives us genomic DNA identification. Genomic meaning it tells us the entire gene, okay? So it's a very small specimen like a hair or a nail, but it tells us a lot of information already. Now, if the person is dead, we can still be able to know if the person took any drugs or any exposure to chemicals because hair and nails can be used for trace metal and drug analysis. Now, if you collect all of this specimen, there is also a proper way of transporting or storage of this specimen. You can store in room temperature specimens such as blood, bone marrow, 
amniotic fluid or chorionic villi. But for solid tissues such as those from a biopsy, autopsy, you have to put them in ice or else the specimen will start to decay. Now that we know what specimens we can use for cytogenetic techniques, then let's start and talk about classical cytogenetics. Again, just to remind you, classical cytogenetics is the process of collecting specimen, um, collecting cells, arresting them at end of prophase or beginning of metaphase, and then um, getting the chromosomes out of the cell and lining them up in an image in order for us to create a karyotype. So once we get the cells, we do first a cell culture. How do we do a cell culture? Or what is a cell culture? A cell culture is the process of multiplying your cells. Let's say you collected buccal cells or buccal cells from the mouth. You were only able to collect, let's say, nine cells from the mouth. Those nine cells wouldn't be enough for us to do cytogenetic techniques. You have to multiply those cells. And the process of multiplying those cells is what we call cell culture. Now, how do we multiply the cells? By giving a mitogenic stimulating agent, something that will cause the cells to undergo mitosis. And that chemical that we use is called PHA or phytohemagglutinin. So this is an example of a cell culture. We put the cell in PHA and wait for it for a few days. That's why earlier I mentioned during amniotic fluid and um, chorionic velos, I mentioned number of days of culture. This is what we mean. After we multiply the cells, then we should be able to arrest the cells at end prophase or at metaphase. So in order for the cells to stop progression of cell division so that it will no longer proceed to anaphase, we should give it a mitotic inhibitor, something that will cause the cells to stop at that stage, at that phase of mitosis. And the chemical that we use is called colsemid. So if we are able to stop the cells at mitosis, then we'll be able to catch them at the stage where they look like sister chromatids. Okay? Sister chromatid appearance na sila. Third is to uh, make the chromosomes escape the cell or to harvest the chromosomes from the cell and from the nucleus. So the third step is to subject the cell to hypotonic swelling. So what do we mean by hypotonic swelling? We put the cell in a solution that has more water than solute. So if there is more water than solute, how will the water molecules move from higher concentration to lower concentration. So the higher concentration is the solution and the water molecules will want to enter the cell. So if the water molecules are going inside the cell, what will happen to the cell? It will swell. And eventually what happens to a swollen cell? It will eventually erupt or better yet, the term is to lies. So cells, to further disperse the chromosomes within the cell, and to lyse any red cells present, we do some hypotonic swelling. And the chemical that we use for that is 0 0.075 molars of calcium chloride. And this is our hypotonic buffer. So we store it at 37 degrees Celsius for 10 to 20 minutes. And look at this. When we put it in calcium chloride or potassium, sorry, potassium chloride solution, the cells start to erupt. And when they erupt, they will release your chromosomes. After the release of the chromosomes, then we must be able to fix the chromosomes or to um, make them 
stay on the slide or on the petri dish or wherever they are so what we use is modified car noise fixative which is composed of a three is to one ratio of absolute methanol and glacial acetic acid or three parts absolute methanol and one part glacial acetic acid so what this chemical will do is to alter the cell membranes and chromosomes by removing lipids and water molecules and to the nature protein so after we erupt the cell membrane we also want to actually destroy all other compounds organelles that are not needed in the karyotype so that's what in the modified carnois fixative does for us after that we do staining so staining is the artificial aging of cells at 65 degrees celsius and we leave it there for 30 to 60 minutes to improve the quality of staining so basically that what the what the staining does is to dehydrate the chromosomes so we treat it with a proteolytic enzyme solution and at that point you will now be able to better visualize the chromosomes so now they have color now you're able to see which ones are long which ones are short etc etc next is we now put it put a metachromatic dye on it so if you still remember the euchromatin is lightly stained heterochromatin is darkly stained and it allows us to do g banding patterns so usually um, the parts which has richer color are those which has many adenine and thymine. Now that we have the chromosomes out of the cell and now that they are colored, we do photomicroscopy. So we looked at it under the microscope and take a picture of the different chromosomes. So this is how they used to do it before, but now with the help of computers, this is how it looks like nowadays. Now, just to remind everyone of the process, again, we do cell culture by putting a mitogenic uh, ingredient. And in this case, we use phytohemagglutinin. After it starts to undergo mitosis, we want to stop them at metaphase by putting a mitotic inhibitor called colsimid. Afterwards, we put them or we want the cells to lyse by putting a hypotonic solution. So that is a 0 0.075 molars of potassium chloride. Afterwards, we do a fixation through modified Carnoy solution, which is three parts um, absolute alcohol and one part glacial acetic acid. And afterwards, we prepare the slide by leaving it for 30 to 60 minutes at 65 degrees Celsius before putting a metachromatic dye. So now that we have our karyotype, if we see any abnormalities, what do we do? Who do we inform? So now we do a case report. So a description of the chromosomal finding should be in international system of cytogenic nomenclature or should be reported to the international system of cytogenic nomenclature or iscn so we do a report when we detect abnormalities if there is a need for genetic counseling if we need to refer them to a specialist or if we want to undergo additional genetic testing okay so that is how you do classical cytogenetics you, you might be thinking, Doc, do we still have hospitals doing classical cytogenetics or are the process now, is a process now more advanced? Well, truth be told, a lot of hospitals still do classical cytogenetics. And there are a few who offer the more advanced tests called FISH or fluorescence in, in situ hybridization. When I was a med tech student 10 years ago, only like less than five hospitals or around five hospitals had fish they were saint Luke's qc saint Luke's bgc um, national kidney and transplant institute makati medical center and uh, the philippine govern the philippine general hospital uppgh yung yung lima na may fish. and i was very fortunate enough to have seen how fish is done in person now what is fish 
So from the name itself, it uses fluorescent dye. Okay? We use fluorescent dye in order for us to mark or to see any abnormalities in the chromosomes. So FISH is the principal molecular technique currently used in clinical cytogenetic laboratories. In processes like FISH, it falls under what is now called molecular cytogenetics. That's why one of the subjects nowadays in your curriculum is um, molecular, molecular biology, right? So it involves applying DNA probes to a chromosome spread. So probes are this fluorescent dye. So it will bind to a known DNA sequence and it will tell us if there are any abnormalities or mutations in the DNA. So not only does it look at chromosomes, but now it binds to the more smaller, um, the more smaller structure of the DNA. So the process is first chromosomes are placed on a microscope slide, and then it is denatured. What do we mean by denatured? Denaturing is the process of separating the double helix into single-stranded DNA. So how do we do denaturation? We either use heat, chemicals, or a pH change. So as seen in the image, this is how usually DNA would look like, a double-stranded helix. But after denaturation, it will separate from each other, producing two single-stranded DNA. Okay, so this is now what it looks like. The second step is to put a complementary DNA probe for the single-stranded DNA that we have. Okay, so this is our target DNA. Again, it was subjected to denaturation. So now we have two individual or two single-stranded DNA. We will create complementary probes, okay, that will attach to those DNA strands. And those probes will have a fluorescent dye. So these circles that you see here, these are fluoropores, and they are the ones that light up once we look at it under the fluorescence microscope. Okay, so we have a um, we have a probe which contains the fluorophore, and we also have a probe that contains the hapten. So what we want to happen here, guys, is to make the fluorophore attached to the haptens. Okay, mag-attach sa dapat jaan, and we will look at it under ultraviolet microscope or fluorescence microscope. So when the DNA is denatured, the probe can then hybridize or form hydrogen bonds because if you remember what is the connection again of your um, complementary base pairs, it is through hydrogen bonds. So if this is the probe created, it will bind to the to the single stranded dna and once it binds that's what we call hybridization that's why it's fluorescence inside to hybridization now the probe will be visible as one or more fluorescent signals in the microscope and you will understand that later on so anyway the nature separated the two strands and probes will be placed on the strand if the probe will not be attached to a fluorophore it will not light up but if it will be attached to a fluorophore it will light up what do we mean by light up here in this next slide Ayan. so the labeled probes will be used to identify different chromosomes or targeted chromosome regions so it will tell us kung merong trisomy, translocations, or deletions. These two terms you will learn later on. Okay? 
So, ganyan siya. Umiilaw siya. Okay? So, as a summary again, we first fix the cell on a slide. Afterwards, we do the denaturation to open up the double-stranded DNA. And then, the third step is to put a probe on the target uh, target region of the DNA. And if the target region has a genetic problem or um, a signal that needs to be alerted, then a fluorescent dye will attach to the probe. And once we look at it under the microscope, it will light up. So one use of fish is actually to form a diagnosis. And usually, the diagnosis is made for cancers. Okay? So... This is how colorful a fish would look like. So each band, ibang kulay yung ginagamit. No? Ayan. Each band would give us a different color. And if we want to check for cancers, we assign a specific color to it. No? Katulad nito, red and green lang siya. Pag may nag-appear na yellow, that's cancer. And may nag-appear na yellow here. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Okay, ganun siya. So if we compare now fish and classical cytogenetics, um, fish can detect diseased cells more easily. Fish does not require living cells. Fish can also quantify, mabibilang niya, ano yung abnormalities and how many abnormalities are there. And it is the computer that counts the fluorescent dots present and no longer will it be... Um, a more or a, a manual labor all right so that's it hopefully you learned something thank you so much guys and bye bye